Now we're going to talk about the 2022 bond referendum for November. Yeah, all I'm going to say is that Mr. Hinton is actually going to be leading uh, this effort for uh, the county. He's put together some teams, assuming that we have a positive reaction from the Board of Supervisors. And so we'll be out about uh, pretty soon. Brandon. Sir. has done a number of these over the years and he's put together all of this information and as far as staff as uh most of the you are the senior person you know on the financial side he's here yes sir yes, sir. wasn't that long ago i was the youngest sir. all right well without further ado thank you brandon yes sir and you know, good afternoon madam chair members of the board it gives me of course great pleasure to continue the public conversation that we all had on november 30th uh, last year regarding the uh, plant bond referendum package coming forth this fall. The presentation before you is requesting additional feedback from the board regarding individual projects, many of which remain unchanged, of course, from November, but in an attempt to lock this down, let's lock this project list down. Uh, we'll go more uh, into more detail on a number of projects in the presentation before you. And of course, we'll invite several subject matter experts to uh, to the podium, and, and Mr. Uh, Alan Bolton is also working uh, with the other guys, so we'll bring some expertise as well. Uh, so we're also going to delve a little more into um, to the refined financials this afternoon, including currently planned bond issue sizing by fiscal year and the order in which projects are proposed to be brought forward for funding. And finally, of course, we'll touch on uh, public outreach plans and a calendar, as we talked about a little bit earlier. For the board's consideration is there are some touch points for the board and uh, some other processes that have to take place prior to having a bond referendum on parent ballot. Diving right into the project list categorized by functional area and likely reflective of four individual questions the, the, uh, the citizens, the voters will see on the ballot this fall, you will not see many changes from our November discussion. Projects in black on the slide, if you can see that, um, or projects that have not changed from that November discussion. Projects in red are those that may have slight tweaks. Um, it, it reflects maybe some small changes from November, beginning with Cox and Middle School. Um, it, we previously noted uh, it, the last time we talked, there was adding capacity. Um, and speaking with staff, we're not sure yet um, if, if the capacity is going to be necessary or not. Additional funding has been added to Holland Springs Elementary School based on the conversation we had in November. And changing that project at this time uh, from a renovation to a rebuild um, in the area of recreational parks. Yes, sir. So, what happened earlier when I put this book? They have, did they not know or how does it my, my guess, and, and, and this can sell us in the room, my guess is they kept it consistent with the presentation given to the school board. Okay. Did the school board adopt the CFP in October? I okay. think they were trying to be consistent. So officially, your comments came after we had approved. Mm -hmm. um, but you guys are okay with us, and and we add money to a project. You haven't heard any. Um, not actually putting you on the spot, so don't put me on the spot. Um, from my school board colleague, she was excited, so I was just. I'm hoping that we don't want to court. So have you heard anything different? I, no, sir. Okay, I, I haven't. I've talked to school staff. We talk on a regular okay. basis. They. Um, as far as the funding side of things, they're going to defer to the board supervisor. Okay, perfect. That's all we need. So, yeah. In the area of recreational parks, uh, we did discuss Deep Bottom Park uh, in November as a potential project. You now see that project is listed as a project on this list. And have added another phase to Tuckahoe Creek Park. And again, we'll go into much more uh, detail on the projects as we move forward. And as far as the presentation goes, I'd like to start by going into projects because that's where the exciting stuff is as discussed in november and as you heard of course from dr cashwell earlier this morning the school board has put forward five projects that address aging schools four elementary schools and a middle school uh, each of these schools are more than 50 years old with the suggested change to rebuild highland springs elementary four of those five projects are considered rebuild projects at this time and one of those being a renovation um, Long and Davis and Palace Springs Elementary Schools and Quaxon Middle School would be your rebuilds. And of course, uh, you'll see on the slide the original Holiday Elementary School is the renovation. Um, Mr. Schmidt and, and the board, I, I heard uh, comments loud and clear earlier this morning, and there's some conversation uh, to be had. 
So we heard loud and clear. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. While you're there, I just want to remind everybody who's just tuned in. I think everybody in this room has been in the conversation this morning, but Ms. Gisella and I are in accordance with the 64 year old school at Johnson. We'd like to we'd like to see the possibility of swapping that out and then finding a different opportunity or a pathway for holiday. Thank you. Two new elementary schools proposed for the, the 2022 bond referendum. One, the Fairfield Magisterial District, a land already owned by the county near the River Mill neighborhood on Route 1. And one, of course, in the West End, which we've discussed on numerous occasions with this board due to existing and future capacity concerns, particularly in the Free Chalk Magisterial District. Pre COVID, elementary schools in these areas were close to exceeding, uh, or they're close to or exceeding their respective capacities. Both of these schools relieve anticipated future capacity concerns in these areas due to planned and future development. And I won't spend a lot of time here. Dr. Cashville spent a good amount this morning discussing the environmental education living building at Boca Farm. School staff, I think it was noted, uh, maybe by the manager, uh, along with Monica Callahan and a couple of other folks, recently took a field trip to the Candela Center at Georgia Tech to get some inspiration for what's possible. You can see. 16.3 million dollars allocated in the pond referendum with this release project. Now sped through schools because I think we went through quite a bit of that this morning. Uh, so jumping uh, into public safety, there are a number of firehouse projects, uh, relocation and replacement projects, as well as a firehouse improvements project. We'll talk about each of those a little more in a moment. But we had talked about these at length. I can recall personally talking about these projects at multiple uh, work sessions and retreats. Uh, over the past few years, um, the relocation of firehouse number six and number one, and the replacement of number 11, of course, uh, land for firehouse six has been purchased at 5,000 square feet. The original firehouse six was built in 1969. It was designed for 20 staff in two units. It now has 34 staff in three units. So the new firehouse six would be 11,000 square feet and uh, built with three bays. Firehouse one was built in 1970. It was also originally designed for two units. The new firehouse one would have four bays and be 12,800 square feet. Firehouse 11 was built in 1964 at 4,200 square feet, uh, which is, of course, inadequate for current operations and has some ADA compliance issues, among others. And uh, to renovate this facility on its existing site is not cost effective. The new firehouse 11 would also be 11,000 square feet. Where exactly is Firehouse 6? Where are they located? I, just, you know. uh, I don't have the, the existing address for Firehouse 6. Chief Alton's on and maybe yeah, we'll ask get, it. Uh, why don't we ask Alec to come on? The, the land for the new 6 is at 4506 North Lane. And 6 is on the bar. It's across from White Oak and then Firehouse okay. Lake. Can we get um, Alec on? Number 1. I'm here, Mr. Manager. Madam. Chair, I believe the question was about the location of Firehouse 6. It's at Laburnum at Jan. And all right of the other the White Oak Complex. Also. I'm sorry, you asked where Station 1 was also? Where are the other stations? Yeah. Uh, station 1 is the one just adjacent to the racetrack. Mm -hmm. Station 11 is on Hungry Road at, at uh, North Run. Thank you. That was awesome. yeah, and, that was and station four is on Strath Road in Verina. My pleasure. Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, a proposed firehouse improvements project uh, would traverse firehouses across the county with additions and renovations at firehouse, firehouses 14, 15, 16, and 17, or as uh, Chief Alton calls the teenage firehouses. They were built from 1988 to 1993. If each are between 5,200 and 5,600 square feet currently, this project would add between 780 and 1,500 square feet to these stations. Each station would add a dedicated PPE and decontamination room to enhance safety and cancer risk reduction efforts. The restrooms and bunk rooms would be renovated to address privacy concerns, but also enhancing fitness rooms and living spaces for firefighters. Can you hold on one minute? Yes. Hey, Chief. Yes, sir. It's a renovation of 16. Is there enough land there to do a proper renovation? 
We've taken a look at it, and, and our uh, capital projects manager, Chuck Fan feels like it's possible. Um, so uh, we will probably engage in a feasibility study just to see exactly what can be done there prior to, to really uh, digging into it too deeply. But yes, sir, we believe there is. So, Madam Chair, members of the board, we talked briefly back in November about the proposed public safety training center. Chief Falls and his team, and of course, with collaboration with Chief English and his team, I put the order a pretty um, amazing concept for this project. Um, and if okay with your indulgence, I'd like to offer Chief Phil Auden an opportunity to speak to this project a little bit more because it is quite fascinating. Chief Auden. Thank you, Brandon. Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Manager, it's good to see you all. This is a pretty exciting project um, because it addresses a gap that was really identified by uh, our managers, management by walking around style. It was brought to our attention when we were doing a station visit. And speaking with the firefighters at station 10 and the fire officer offered to us how beneficial it would be for our members to be able to train in buildings similar to the ones uh, where they respond to fires. This project addresses that gap and is related to changes in development in the Henrico community, specifically the emergence of urban mixed use or UMU construction across all magisterial districts in Henrico. The UMU developments pose a different set of risks and challenges to Henrico public safety responders compared to the traditional construction types. This proposal presents a solution that will allow Henrico fire police and other public safety partners to engage in really realistic training that prepares them to effectively protect the community and themselves in emergency situations. Many uh, division of fire and division of police members grew up fighting fires and crime in traditional single family homes. And I, I saw the uh, earlier in the presentation where we were talking about that distribution and the development, but they, we grew up in single family homes in neighborhoods like the ones um, that we've seen in the previous slides, single family homes, garden style apartments. And these buildings contain small rooms with predictable floor plans and hazards that are known to us after years of experience and training in similar environments. These buildings don't contain things like long hallways, large open areas, or other construction or design features that make UMU buildings so dangerous for our first responders. The DOF currently uses a 5,800 square foot burn building that you've all seen to conduct live fire training scenarios. Even though firefighters are able to experience simulated fire conditions, the burn building's construction type and floor plan are not similar to the buildings commonly found in the community now. Firefighters that have trained in this building more than a few times have memorized the floor plan, which reduces the real realism of the training. And Henrico Police currently uses a stress house to conduct active threat training and has similar challenges. There are potential risks associated with public safety responders not practicing like they must perform. And realistic training for first responders is critical because it allows them to fill gaps in their experience. It leads responders that are more prepared to save lives and property in the community they serve. And if the training's too artificial, it won't mimic an actual emergency. In recent years, as, as the planning office discussed, the Enrico landscape has changed and transitioned to include things like two up, two down. Mr. Manager, I think you mentioned those townhomes or condominiums, four story townhomes, urban mixed use apartment, business, and apartment combinations, and mid rise layouts, uh, like we see in Libby Mill as well. In addition to existing strip malls and big box stores that contain long hallways and some unpredictable floor plans. These buildings create unique challenges for first responders that don't exist in traditional style structures. Without the ability to train in these UMU spaces, responders run a higher risk when working to save lives and property in these buildings. The proposed solution is a construction of a tactical, what we've called a tactical training facility. The facility would include four buildings that come in two phases and would be built at the Woodman Road Drill Facility. The project would consist, as I said, of two phases, the first phase being the tactical training facility uh, that would consist of a new 6,000 square foot, four story, um, also including a basement, townhouse style training structure, and a 24,000 square foot, four story urban mixed use style training structure. These structures would be designed and constructed to provide the look and feel of contemporary structures encountered throughout Henrico County. It also include a street, a streetscape design similar to, if you may be familiar with the FBI Academy's Hogan's Alley, uh, that adds more realism. The project scope would also include site work, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, and theatrical smoke production systems. These new structures generally consist of concrete footings and slab on grade with structural systems of concrete and steel, concrete roofs, 
sectional garage style doors and an, an actual working elevator. These structures shall be uh, specifically designed to drain water from the interior and retain the theatrical smoke while having various training props built into them with movable wall systems, forcible entry door props, forcible window props, and roof ventilation props. The scope of phase two of the tactical training facility would consist of the construction of a new 9,000 square foot, three-story garden style apartment training structure and a 10,000 square foot field house. The proposed field house facility would be pre-engineered climate controlled metal building with 24 foot clearance, an open floor plan and some administrative space to conduct routine phys uh, physical assessments of candidates and incumbents, as well as host indoor training evolutions. The garden style apartment would consist of six apartments, all with different layouts that mimic what we'll see in our community and also include a forcible entry simulator, living room, bedrooms, kitchens on each apartment floor. And they're also designed to provide the look and feel of a contemporary structure encountered throughout Henrico County. They would also have two versions of a roof vent simulator, which would allow our firefighters to practice that, uh, that uh, skill as well. Uh, both phases of this project intended to allow our public safety first responders to properly prepare for and respond to emergencies and the type of structures that we'll, that we'll see in our community. Uh, with that, I'd be happy. I recognize this is a big project, maybe some questions around it. So I'd, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions that you might have. So do I have any questions? Where did the model for this came from where? Was that model or you just kind of? That, that's a great uh, question, sir. Uh, there really isn't a model for this. This is something that was developed. Um, the genesis came from employees. Um, and the team got together uh, that included members of all ranks, uh, all tenures to really talk about what kind of uh, training facility would would represent the best opportunity for us to keep our members safe. So I, I, I'm, I'm actually happy to say I can't point to another fire department in the nation, maybe the fire department of New York that has a similar uh, similar design as this, this would definitely be a, a pretty big fire service beacon for the region, if not the, uh, the East coast, really. So we, we are the model. We will be the model around here anyway. Have you talked to your colleagues and other regions? I mean, is this something that would benefit them too or what? Yes, sir. I think what we're seeing is, is some pretty good cooperation between the public safety agencies in this region and really throughout the state. Um, so I do believe that there would be some use in both the fire and law enforcement communities uh, for use of, of this tactical training facility um, and, uh, and would, would enhance that cooperation and that regional, regional and statewide partnership. Um, this is, excuse me, this is an $18 million project, correct? Yes, ma'am, and it's split into two phases as well. Um, when you said uh, on the roof, are you talking about a flat roof? Because some of these have a pitched roof, you know, the four stories and even dormers. I mean, what sort of, yes. I, I assume it's because you're going to have to repel down the side of the building or something. Is that the kind of thing that you do or? We do, we do that at the current facility and this new facility would also add opportunities for that. You mentioned the roof pitch and the, uh, the, Garden style apartment structure will have both a flat roof simulator and a pitched roof simulator for doing the roof ventilation practice. Um, with these structures that, of course, we've already approved, um, are you going to have to buy taller ladder trucks or more trucks and other equipment too? I just, you know, I thought about that as as they go up, but do the ladder trucks reach the fourth floor? If you're discussing the um, the development in the community, it does it does create uh, some opportunities for us to adapt to what's going on uh, out there. Um, there aren't a whole lot of ladder truck op options that uh, go higher than a hundred feet, um, and and that's really what we shoot for, which is about ten stories. And so, um, you know, we go beyond that. We really are required to to get inside the building and and um, and affect rescues that way. Um, we don't really have an option to do it from the outside. And uh, of course, we train for that. And a lot of the fire protection systems that go into the buildings that are being constructed, the mid and high rise buildings with sprinkler systems and protected stairwells are all taking into consideration 
um, our tactical operations and how we've got to uh, extinguish the fire and rescue the occupants in those settings. So I was thinking that these type of buildings are built with um, concrete or cinder blocks or that sort of thing, right? Because you have to be able to use them again. But some of these buildings, um, if they're under five stories, they're they're actually um, stick built or wooden. They're wooden structures. They're not steel in the interior. I'm assuming you you figured that out about how to accommodate that and tra do training. I mean, I know how important these are. Just just curious. Yes, ma'am. The um the some of the structures that we're seeing out there uh, in the urban mix, mixed use environment are uh, as you as you pointed out stick built, and they do uh, put in some protection mechanisms, uh, firewalls, and uh, sprinkler systems that help mitigate the risk that's associated with uh, with structures that are built out of wood. And so uh, we're part of the construction process. We're part of the plans review process. To try and minimize risk anywhere, uh, anywhere that we can, and encourage compliance with the with those codes. Thank you. When this is built, we'll be driven, uh, probably be asked to if to do training by other other locales, Northern Virginia, Virginia Beach, you know, Roanoke Southwest. Um, so, and we would absolutely welcome that. Uh, Having these locales come in, yes, yes, sir. And uh, you know, I, I was speaking with Mr. Thornton um, a couple of weeks ago, and I remember a, a statement that he made about uh, being our our brother's keeper. And, and we're blessed to be a community that has resources, and and there are others that aren't as as um, well resourced as this community. And and I take that to heart. And and uh, when we consider building something like this, or we consider putting on training programs. We're always conscious of our of our partners uh, throughout the region and throughout the Commonwealth that that may not be able to put these events on or or construct these types of facilities on their own and and so we do welcome them and and we do feel that in the fire service we are a brother's keeper and we recognize our blessings and and um and we'll we'll pay that forward as much as we're able. Good. And the other thing I would ask is when we we do bring these these other locales in. On behalf of schools and and uh, our county, let's get them to uh, go out and eat dinner and lunch in our local restaurants. And stay in our local hotels, if you would. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? I I think is that all from. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you very much. Thank you. Get your fires to respond to my house. <laughs> no, but you know, every time I think about this, like we are letting it go up. So, at ten stories, you have to have steel. But five and under, you just bet you build it with wood. And it, you know, they he as he said, obviously they're sprinkled and all that other stuff. That just keeps oh, yeah. it from burning up faster. So, I think this is important. Okay. So the, the last of the public safety projects and the first of the recreation and parks projects are proposed to be located on 205 acres purchased by the county in 2008 in the Three Shot Magic Steel District. $15 million proposed for a no kill animal shelter, a project Mr. Brandon noted earlier, and $30 million proposed for a new park and necessary road improvements in Three Shot. For the park project, $15 million will be allocated towards the park and $15 million towards those road improvements. The park would be the beginning of an athletic village to include fields, restroom and concession, playground equipment, shelters, trails and parking. As discussed in November, a no-kill animal shelter would allow for the expansion of animal, animal protection services and provide the community with additional opportunities for animal rescue, surrender and adoption. And much like the Frank Thornton Aquatic Center, the intent here is for this facility to be operated by a third party nonprofit. Agency, and, and there are a number of uh, moving parts to this project. And we actually thought it best for Mr. Emerson, who's who's here, to maybe address some of those parts. And I'd like to invite him up to uh, talk a little bit about. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Manager, members of the board. Uh, I'll just briefly go over the master plan, a little history of this property. 
Brandon has, has covered a great deal of it. I know many of you are aware of it. As, uh, as noted, uh, this is 205 acres. It was acquired in 2008 for county use for rec and parks, schools, utilities, fire and fueling station. Some of those uses have subsequently found other locations. Um, the school use of a high school in 2008, we honestly thought when we purchased this property, we would be occupying that school uh, in 2020. Uh, but then the recession hit and the world as we knew it changed. The uh, rapid growth we were seeing in, these, in the school population shifted. And of course, the necessity wasn't there at that time for the, uh, for the school. The remote's not working. Okay. I'll... <laughs> Oh, one or here. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just describe it. Let's just tell Fred what I want to use. Yeah, you don't want any more blank screens. Yeah. Right. I apologize for that. Uh, there is some additional land included in this property that is directly along Gaten Road. This property, many of you will recall, was a land trade with Bob Babcock. This property fronts North Gate for approximately 2,125 linear feet. It is 3.649 acres in size. It was formerly the Smith Holdings, and it was split by the construction of North Gate Road. And when we built, uh, we built North Gate, and then we we set up the inter interchange essentially with. Uh, with 64 and with the Cova, we had some excess land that uh, Mr. Babcock needed for the Cova development. He had this property and it worked out with us. It was sort of an equal swap. The bulk area parcel of 200 of the 205 acres excludes a one quarter acre cemetery that you can see there. Um, and that's a separate parcel, and it's inclusive of a second cemetery on the par property that's known as the Henley Cemetery. The elevation ranges from 278 at the eastern corner to the western rear of the property of 172 feet. You do have a Dominion Virginia power, power line that comes along. Pretty much where the road is. I, I apologize, it's right below the road. Um, it runs along the the southern part of the property, it's a hundred foot tall transmission line. The site does contain some non-tidal wetlands to the west along the, the environmental features, which you can see it on the map. Uh, you have waters of the U.S. associated with Tucko Creek, perennial stream with a hundred foot RPA buffer and a floodplain. You have approximately 1600 feet, linear feet of frontage on Kane Road. That road is a minor collector on the MTP. Uh, you can see you do not have all of the uh, frontage along the road. You do have some out parcels. Concept Road 132 would be the future extension of west of the westward of Leesfield Farm Drive through and in proximity to the southern boundary of the site. Now, what you see on this conceptual is you do have a line that's uh, noted for Conceptual Road 132. That's the way we reflect it in our MTP plan. What you also see reflected on it is uh, the current design save the the southerly turn which will which will straighten out of what actually may become uh, concept road 132 lease field extended that's 4075 linear feet uh, planned four lane divided it may reduce to three lanes as it moves towards the rear based on demand the proposed avenue development exists south of the property uh, currently on the Board of Supervisors agenda for Tuesday evening for your consideration. This site consists of three separate ownership properties totaling 183 acres. It is planned to contain 1600 housing units and 150,000 square feet of commercial space. As you heard from uh, Mr. Chan earlier, uh, from a utility standpoint, public water is along Northgate Road. And sewer will extend from the south to the north of the two lines that I have marked on this map, varying in sizes from 24 inch to 16 to 12 and ultimately size. Several master plans have been developed for this property over time, including uh, 
several plans that we have developed in the last six or eight months, working with uses and trying to determine where possibly in the future they might might exist. Uh, the one you see on the on the on the screen today uh, reflects possible road use and some possible uses. The one on the screen reflects the animal shelter adjacent to a public use trail system, which of course is part of the uh, needed rec and parks facilities in the area, athletic fields and school uses, again, along with concept roads of 126 and 132. 126 does extend northward towards Kane Road. As you will note, several out parcels exist, along with the previous mentioned cemeteries. You have three properties of note. Uh, two to the uh, to the east along North Gayton, a 7.8 acre parcel and a 2.47 acre parcel. To the north, you've got a 1.5 acre parcel that could round out the property for full use, but they are not completely necessary for this master plan to function. And while the MTP indicates connection to Kane Road in two locations, there will be no connection to Kane Road until it's fully improved. And that's all the fun facts I have for you on this property. If you have any questions, I'll certainly be happy to try and answer this for you. I've been working on this for, for six years. I don't have any questions. And thank you for putting that last statement in, Joe. Because that's the only question I've gotten. Is this going to connect to Kane Road? And the answer is no. Go back to that real quick, Brian. No kill, quote unquote. Is there any other name that we can? Um, does it have to be called no kill shelter? I mean, call whatever you want to sir. It, it, uh, it, it's going to be called something, but no kill just identifies it identifies what it is, and that's a national. That's a national thing. Okay. That's correct. So and so, what does it mean? Um, forgive me because I've never heard of no kill shelter. Right. So in our like our current shelter. Right. If if a dog isn't adopt, uh, adopted or it's not fostered and the humane society doesn't come in, um, the the animal is terminated. Um, and I didn't know that. yeah, uh, and that's cats, dogs. Oh yeah. It tells you how many were euthanized. So I didn't read it. There has been a lot of a lot of. Uh, requests outcry, not just in Henrico, but nationally, that if if you do keep the dogs, you can get them fostered and you can right. and cats without having to kill them. Uh, the, the neat part about this would be uh, there's also a problem with neutering and spading, right? And this as we're working through it with the Humane Society and the veterinary uh, groups, uh, there'll be a, not a clinic, but a, in a, the capability of doing spading and neutering in it as well. So this is what our little shelter on Woodman Road, which we'll still keep and use, but tripled. So what? Who else has a, anybody else has a no kill shelter right here? Not anywhere in uh, yet again, not anywhere in the area. Richmond, doesn't Richmond, uh, Richmond is, I think. They, so the, um, the Henrico Humane Society, um, Mr. Brandon reached out to, but the closest example is the facility near the diamond. Okay. The, the uh, who runs at the yes. humane. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's yeah. the Robin Star Center. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Wow. I just, I mean, you would just think with the with the animal craze over the last couple of years since COVID anyway, that there would be no animals that people don't want. But it's crazy to think. Well, because I need to read my full monthly report. <laughs> the novel that we get every month, I need to, because I need to read it all the week. <laughs> 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 it's just because you said, ah, that's three chop. I don't need to read that book. <laughs> SPCA said that sometimes they get dogs, such as there were some um, that had been used for, for fighting. Um, yeah. What are they called? Pit bulls. Pit bulls that have been trained to fight, and they are not adoptable. 
and uh, most shelters would use euthanize them because they're very they're vicious. They found somewhere that they could send them. I mean, yeah. So all of this came from an idea, and these projects all have a, an origination. I mean, the, the training center there was a. a Fireman at Firehouse 10 who brought that idea forward. Uh, Mr. Brandon brought this idea forward. And what is really unique about this project is that ultimately you're talking about another public private partnership where you bring in the Humane Society and some other volunteers. Obviously, we wrap around staff, but this could be a real community asset. And there is a there is a significant need. Um, you know, you think about dogs, you think about cats, you think about other animals. Um, maybe we should have a work session where animal control comes in and it's about and a humane yeah. being a broken. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that, that'd be helpful. The positioning of this in the back is because of the trails, the wetlands that aren't buildable. They'll be able to utilize that with the animals as well. I do know at our current shelter, it gets, um, if you go there and talk to the employees that have to be involved in these euthanization, they get kind of depressed after a while. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard on them. And um, this could be a good alternative. Yeah. Sounds like we call it the Newman, Newman symbol. <laughs> oh, by the way. Madam Chair, with your indulgence, I also understand that it's Brandon's birthday today. It is. Oh, it oh. is. Bring some uh, uh, cappuccino. A <laughs> 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 pepperoni. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, ten million dollars, uh, keeping the recreational parks category, ten million dollars for Deep Bottom Park, would stabilize and restore the entire six hundred fifty foot shoreline. Including replacing the existing public boat ramp system. Uh, the park entry road and internal park road system would be improved and parking would be reconfigured. The house on the property, an underground gravel conveyor, would be demolished. And a large shelter, a large park shelter, and interpretive structure would be built to tell the history of the site. Existing trails would be upgraded and extended across Four Mile Creek Marsh with boardwalks. Uh, funding for this project would also include a dedicated boat dock. A lift for fire to house uh, their boat and storage for police in the Department of Wildlife Resources boats and secure fenced area on the park property. Um, so Deep Bottom, Deep Bottom Park has been on the CIP for how long? Wow. Uh, I mean, I think it was on the CIP before I got on board. I, I think it's been there yeah. for a while as well. Yes, sir. And no one is living in the house now? Is anybody living in the house? Yeah, I, I thought it. at some point somebody was living there, right? It, yeah, that was years ago, oh, and, okay. and that was transferred. At, police uses it. Okay. Yeah. And so um, I, I, I don't want to correct, but the, the fire uh, boat is yeah. it may or may not be part of the approved project right now. That boat is happy at Rockets Landing. And so um, I, we're really not looking to move the Navy anywhere new right now. Are they going out in this weather? It just depends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a responsibility with the port. That's how we got the boat. So whenever they need us, we need to be ready to go. Okay. So uh, the last recreation parks project uh, for the coming bond referendum is $5 million to continue the Tucko Creek Park project with the ultimate goal, of course, of connecting the boardwalk from Patterson Avenue to Broad Street. That's uh, so we've talked at length about drainage of beers and treats and work sessions. Mr. Yob also updated the board on a trip to Charlotte, North Carolina recently. Uh, Public Works has identified more than $55 million in projects in their five year CIP. The 22 referendum does propose $50 million in this area. Um, and also, it's entirely possible that we can leverage those dollars for additional resources. Uh, you've heard some of the examples of what's possible here land acquisition, stream restoration, or improvements. Also, uh, my understanding, talking to Mr. Yob, $500,000 grant is coming uh, from DCR to allow staff to get started in prioritizing some of these projects. So, getting a head start, getting ready for this project should it pass. 
I'm sure I'll never get old. But that was a heck of an improvement. Uh, um, I do have a I do have a question. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely needed, and every time I've had a, a a town meeting about drainage, how do we sell this? You know, as a bond ref friend of mine, it's not very exciting or sexy, or it's my school, or rah rah rah, or I love the park. How do we? How are we going to sell that? That's the only thing thought that I have. I mean, I know I could probably just point out everybody yeah. who got you in know, Brooklyn. I can sell that. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> But it's right. flat. I mean, it's uh, we have that is a that's high priority for folks. I know it's not everywhere, but yeah. that'll sell. My, uh, yeah, but if we can find a way, they'll want to know exactly yeah. which project you're going to do. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that's just to piggyback off of what Ms. O'Bannon was saying, like <laughs> the, the specificity of it, and then how it touches each district. And I mean, clearly, fifty million dollars looks like a lot, but once you start talking about these projects. You know, we're not going to be able to fix all our drainage road problems, but I say find the worst and put them in pictures and, and you know, it's, it's certainly a heck of a start. Uh, people may have noted it kind of long when I was in yours the last time this with the referendum was in the early 80s. It was a much smaller amount. This is a this is an intention to get started. It, it, uh, the last one we did pass, but we've also had one that failed. This is also, it's not under credit card wrong. This could be a wild card, but it's, this is. This is the alternative to a stormwater tax. Oh, absolutely. So, so, so to all the okay. constituents, so if you this is or so we're going to say tax. <laughs> we're going to say that. Right? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 so we're going to we're going to use our debt capacity, borrow money, address drainage, and it's not on your backs. The city does stormwater. Yeah. So we're the only locality that I'm aware of in the Chesapeake Bay MS4 basin that doesn't charge. So Chesapeake has all. Yes. Sir. Okay, good. Yeah. 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 Right. I just want to know how to sell it. <laughs> you gotta give me uh, the chest. There's and Dan in your district. Uh, see the Brooklyn. It might be Brooklyn district. Brooklyn and Fairfield. There's there's we just put some sewer in, and and that neighborhood over by Bird Park. Ryan Park. Yeah, right, right on the border of Fairfield yeah, right. and Brooklyn. Yeah. There, there are because I was. When the sewer was going in, I wanted to see what it looked like. And there are sheds on cinder blocks that are chained to, to trees so they don't float away during a rainstorm. Mr. Thornton and I have had to retrieve yeah. dumpsters from downstream back to lots of places. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I was like, wow. Yes. So, how can you not sell that? Take yeah. a picture of that. No, it's no. called Lakeside. No, for a reason. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> so, the, the next section of the presentation will take the project list you just saw, all the different projects, and focus on the comprehensive financial plan of the bond referendum, um, which is currently totaling, as you can see on the slide, uh, a little over four, five hundred and fourteen million dollars in all. So, uh, you can see the four categories on the chart. We talked about these earlier. Led, of course, by the allocation of schools, which is planned to get two thirds of this entire amount or $340.5 million. The second largest allocation would be towards public safety at nearly $84 million, followed by drainage at $50 million and recreation parks at $40 million, respectfully. respectively. Uh, and to ensure utmost affordability, I think this is incredibly important. The working plan for the bond referendum, referendum as it uh, currently exist is to allocate these funds to issue bonds over a six year period. And I think that's really important. We cannot do, as we've explained many times in prior referendum, we can't do all these projects at one time. We have to spread them out for affordability. Uh, and with that in mind, the next few slides actually go into each project by category, inclusive of dollar amounts and which fiscal year uh, these funds we plan for appropriation. But you'll also see as we go through these a column at the far uh, right of the chart that's called fund early. You'll see five projects in all uh, totaling $20 million in the fund early categories with intention of funding, plan and design, other costs up front uh, within the proposed budget coming to you this March uh, and the managed proposed budget. And uh, funding these projects early does a number of things. One, it gives us a one year head start. 
We did this in the 2016 referendum for a number of school renovations. So the design of those projects were complete as we issued the first bonds and we were able to get right into construction. Uh, so we want to make these projects shovel ready if we can, because I do know their priorities. Um, and Ms. Kinsella could vouch for the ones on the slide it is being priorities of the school board. Um, and, and you know, also the second thing it does is it gets the amount, the total amount of the referendum down closer to that $500 million mark that has been a little bit of our goal as we've talked about on many occasions. In conversations with school staff and the school board and through the school board's approved CIP, it's been quite clear uh, the school board's priority and the priority listing, uh, beginning, of course, with the rebuild of Davis along in elementary schools, which, which uh, Ms. Dr. Cashwell mentioned earlier, as well as the environmental education living building. And you can see those projects up front with some early funding coming for those three projects to get them uh, designed and conceptualized. You can also see a project slated to receive early design funding, Quaxon Middle School, has also been known as a high priority. And you can see funding happening in the first year for that project as well. Uh, if you look at the six year plan for this, you can see total projects, including the, what I call again the funder over category, totaling $350 million over the six year period for schools. Looking at public safety projects amounts uh, and priority, I noted earlier we own the land for Firehouse 6. So uh, $2 million uh, is included in the, what I call, again, the fund early category to get this project started. Uh, it is the first one out of the shoot for public safety. And uh, you can also see a number of other projects in this category and where they land on the, uh, on the appropriation and bond issue list. Looking at drainage, the existing plan, uh, we talked about the $50 million, is to allocate $10 million a year for five years. Um, of the referendum of all the first five years. For recreation parks, you can see a priority on the continuation of Tuckahoe Creek Park, as well as funding road improvements necessary for the three chopped area park and animal shelter, as we discussed earlier. So, summarizing each of the slides you just saw and to really get a perspective. Yes, sir. Quickly go back to the slides, I'd be appreciative. Yes, sir. To, uh, <clears throat> prevail and want to ask the indulgence of my colleagues. I, I thought that uh, I had um, been working for a, a couple of projects, so I want to mention this to you today. It, 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 it seems to me that one of the things that we've been working on is, is uh, with baseball. Baseball, one of those sports that's been waning. We've been trying to bring it back. We've done a good job. I want to compliment uh, Pastor Nelson on his uh, new project for the stadium in uh, Arena. And so we have a we have a facility on Florida Street, and, and I'm thinking that this is the judicious moment to make sure that we put an infusion of funds in there to bring that uh, facility up to par where it can be. Um, I thought I had spoken to someone about this, maybe it fell through the cracks, but I would think that project could be done to enhance that field, which has a great history, by the way, somewhere between uh, five to eight billion dollars. Okay. And lastly, uh, this is the one I thought that was going to see, but I, I don't see it. I think there's another project with three lakes. And if I'm off the, uh, you know, if I'm off here, please share it with me. But Three Lakes has another plan, another project that I don't see being funded in this area. And I think we were relying on this particular um, infusion of funds also. So, Mr. Thornton, so Mr. Thornton, that project, I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm sorry to interrupt. That was a 2016 bond referendum project, and it's coming for the board here shortly. It's coming for? It is. It's the last of the projects coming forward from the 16 referendum. You'll see Neil Luther bring that up in the coming months. Very good. Uh, so okay. that would, so that would take care. Absolutely, sir. Okay, so then I, I want to throw then all of my weight in to Border Street uh, Athletic Project out there, and I'm thinking that that's worth uh, our investment. And I just hope that I can act the indulgence of my colleagues to add that as an addition. Uh, five to eight million dollars should take care of that. Uh, we put some money in there a few years ago, and then we were even more fortunate to have. In 2011, the new facility called the Eastern Rico Recreation Center 
and that other place has been waning and it looks somewhat deteriorated, but it, it, it really has possibility. So I want to ask my colleagues to really consider, uh, let's put some infusion of funds into the border street uh, oh, project. And so, uh, so that would be the, good for the future. Is that where, that's where, um, that's where Glenn Lee used to be. Yes, sir. That's, That's where right, Glenn Lee used to be. Used to be before they got before exactly. they to the rec recreation. Exactly. Exactly. And also that'll bring some type of a pride to the persons who can't live on that area. And just imagine you know we've been working over there diligently. And we got one of the uh, persons who live over there who came up and uh, he actually said one night at a meeting, Mr. Mr. Thorne doesn't know I'm gonna say this, but hey. Let's have this. I think he called it Quad Center, but this gentleman, he he loves Heraco County, and he lives over in that area. Um, so, I'm asking my colleagues to support this initiative for the Border Street Athletic Project. Mr. Thornton, you know what I thought you were going to say when you started with Henrico's trying to enhance baseball. I thought you were going to say, "Let's finally take care of the squirrels and move them to Henrico." I was not that insightful. <laughs> so just for a perspective, uh, the that, that water is in the CIP. It's in the second year. It is a $5.7 million project request. Ms. Thorpe, to your point, it has been in the CIP for a number of years. But it's not funded. Right. So, right. Uh, That, uh, Frank Thorne won't see, but at least won't be around. And so I just like to still encourage us to put that into this project here. That would be under the um, recreation and parks. Yes. Is that what you're talking it would be in that project, would not add any operational costs. It is a renovation of the uh, facility. The facilities there, so you're not looking at any operational impact. I think what Brandon is getting ready to show you from a debt service standpoint, affordability. Um, if you were to add the 5.7 million dollars to the package, it would be an addition for Fairfield, but you would be within all of our guidelines for debt. So there wouldn't be anything uh, that uh, 5 million dollar addition would bump up against. Really quickly summarizing uh, each of the fiscal years, you'll see uh, everything you just saw summarized in the one package. Uh, you'll see five hundred fourteen million dollars. And I'm sorry, sir, Mr. Thornton, can you guarantee that all of those people around there will come out and vote yes across the board for this bond record? I can never guarantee all, but I do think it would be an infusion of pride in most of it. So, so what you see here is uh, as we issue bonds, and this is more for our finance team, you'll see total amounts of the bonds issued over the six year period. One thing I do want to note is 45% of this referendum come in the first two fiscal years, uh, which is not uncommon when we come out with a bond referendum. We try to get all these projects or priorities. Uh, we do want to do as many as we can up front, but 45% of the referendum will happen in those first two fiscal years. Now we're talking about affordability a moment ago. Um, you've seen this before. Zero expected issues. We have projected uh, some very conservative assumptions. One of those assumptions being interest rates. We know interest rates are going to rise. Uh, being a triple triple A rated locality, we are guaranteed to get the lowest possible interest rate out there. Uh, these we have assumed four percent. Our finance team is very confident we will not hit four percent interest on these. So all of these numbers will be better as we issue debt. Uh, we can almost assure you these are worst case scenario in our mind. And that goes for debt service as well. Again, assuming high interest rates, higher than we think they're going to be. You'll see a spike in uh, $91 million. I don't think, again, that'll happen. We try to avoid those spikes. Uh, again, these are highly likely uh, much higher than where they're going to land as we issue bonds over the coming years. Again, taking advantage of that triple, triple A bond rating. 
spoken this this morning. There are some touch points with the school board and with the board. Um, February 10th is the next school board meeting. Uh, the intent is to bring forward um, and, and Mr. Newby actually has drafted a resolution uh, for the school board's consideration that would um, request the board supervisors to adopt a resolution requesting circuit court to order a referendum on the school's question. We've done these in all prior referendums a legal obligation. Uh, the board of supervisors would take that to advisement. The plans to bring that to the very next board meeting for consideration and bring the referendum forward for um, for the circuit court's consideration to be an item on the ballot um, this this fall. And you can see there's a lot of technical items within the circuit court and things to get it on the ballot. Staff and our attorney, our amazing attorney's office will help take care um, of all of those complications. Uh, and, and nuances. Well, we'll say, I heard it earlier, uh, early voting begins September 23rd. That is a date that's uh, tattooed on me. Um, it is one that we, uh, we are going, uh, we are shooting for. And uh, we'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, we've learned through prior referenda that the key to any successful referenda is community education and engagement. That's that's where it's at, is to get out in the community and to ensure the community understands exactly what it is they're being asked to vote on. Please note, I use the words education and engagement. By law, county staff are not allowed to advocate or supervisors and other elected officials are allowed to have uh, to uh, advocate as long as we're not using public dollars to do so. Um, Mr. Newby made me, wanted me to make sure I noted that piece of it, uh, but staff are gonna go out again, educate and uh, engage and make sure folks understand what it is that we're, um, we're doing. Ben Shepard, his team, to say the least, they're gonna be incredibly busy. Uh, the team has given us tools that we simply did not have in 2016, namely social media and our, and our significant presence on social media. His team's also going to create some general information brochures that would melt every household, every every address in Henrico County, as well as utility bill inserts and email blast. Henrico School certainly has an incredible, uh, a vast email uh, database that uh, will be looking to partners with us as they were in 2016 and the prior referenda. So the information going out through our school system is is incredibly important. Other tools we have today that we did not have in 2016 are virtual options. Thanks to Travis Bear and his team, uh, not knowing where COVID is this summer as we're uh, talking to people. Having that option is critical and maybe the only option in some cases. Um, in fact, Ben uh, Shepard and I talked just this past week. It's highly likely we'll have some um, some public meetings virtually, at least a handful, uh, where we may reach one 200 people, if not more, at one time. And uh, just like we did back in the day, we were having big meetings at Tucker High School and other auditoriums. We could do those as well as um, virtual options to talk to folks. And I think that's an incredible asset to us as we educate our community. And it's not just Ben's team that's going to be busy. Uh, what we learned in 2013 and 2016 is that we need multiple speaking teams. There will absolutely be days and moments where we have two, three, four teams out at one time in the community. Uh, these teams are intended to be flexible, of course. Uh, as is with my team, for example, if, uh, if Mr. Massey can't be there, somebody will come in this place if we need him there. Um, so we will make sure we can touch as many people as we possibly can. Again, uh, early voting begins September 23rd, so from July until September 22nd, mark that pound. Uh, this is the road hard. Uh, we had 100 meetings, or well over 100 meetings in both 2013 and 2016. I promise you we'll have at least that amount in this one. Uh, we'll be reaching out to HOAs, we're reaching out to all sorts of groups. Mr. Nelson was gracious enough to allow us to speak at his town hall meeting on Thursday about this. I uh, would love to come and staff would love to come talk about that at your respective town halls. If there's an HOA or someone that reaches out that likes uh, more information, I will personally be there, I'd love to be there. My team is probably going to hate me as they have in the past because um, I don't say no and uh, we'll, be, we'll be out there talking to folks. Uh, ben and Travis is also where they're going to create a website for this purpose as well. It'll show folks uh, how many meetings, when the meetings are going to take place, how can they find out more information. If we can get two people in a room, we're going to go. Uh, two people talk to five, who talk to five, and you know, this is how word spreads. And uh, this is exactly what we want. So, again, if you have folks, uh, certainly just for everyone in the room that, that would like more information on this, please let us know, and we will absolutely be there. 
Uh, Mr. Newby has drafted up some uh, potential, I want to say potential questions for the ballot in November. They're being vetted by bond council as we speak. We think we're going to be okay with these. Uh, I won't read these questions out to you, but they look very similar to the 2016 bond referendum, especially the schools question. Uh, one that's a little unique, of course, is drainage. It's been, again, since the early 80s, since we've had a drainage question. Uh, but the, the intent of these questions is to make it where uh, they're entirely flexible. That uh, by law, we issue bonds, we want to make sure that we have the flexibility to buy equipment, that we furnish new facilities, that it's not just construction, bricks and mortar, it's, uh, it's, it's everything that comes with it. Uh, and just a quick reminder, of course, you've seen the slide three or four times now. Not every referendum has been successful in Henrico. Uh, again, I, my personal opinion and, and what we've seen is getting out in the community and talking to folks and educating, uh, engaging is uh, is a recipe for success. We'll do that and we'll talk to as many people as we possibly can, whether it's in person, social media, uh, brochures, many, many different outlets. But this will be uh, priority one for me this summer, uh, particularly July through. September and, and beyond, all the way until November the 8th, but it's uh, the, the election day. And uh, county chair members of the board, that's what happens. Never if you have any answering questions. Mr. Manager, he's wondering, he wants to be assured that it's going to be on a bond referendum. So, um, you know, if it, if the, there's no, it, really, it's a question for the board. There's no question on the financial standpoint that's as to whether or not we can. We can add it absolutely, um, and we uh, we may have some savings on the deep bottom uh, project because I wasn't aware that the uh, uh, the fire um, and police folks would actually locate there. I don't, you know. When is this is coming to us on what Tuesday? The final uh, to you. The next voting option for the board is the second meeting in February. Second meeting of February. Yes, sir. School board. Is that when we they're they're doing it? Okay. School board so, does it first, then we'll do it. I would I I don't I don't have I'm a big parks guy, so I'm I'm good with with that. I I look at five million and and think I did Freeman softball at 178. I did Tucker baseball. At 180, what the heck would 5 million build? So let us Lover let field. That's right. Uh, uh, yeah. That, that's for our guys. So I, I, I'm, I'm in support of it, but I think that dollar figure it is not right okay. in, in the cost of construction, even today. And the cost of, I, I think that's. Um, I'm being told it's a real number, but we'll, we'll circle back. And uh, Mr. Thornton, I'd like to go out to, uh, it's been a while since I've been out to Walmart, but you and I and Neil, if we could take a walk through the property and assess, um, but Neil's telling me the, the number in the CIP includes basically all of the infrastructure in the park. I think the only thing I would suggest to Mr. Thornton, and I know um, the board of facility would need to upgrade. I think the the only part of it is I think the Glenn Lee organization plays out there. And I'm not sure how you might want to follow up with them to like find out about how strong their um their program is right now. If we're gonna put that amount of money, because you know the thing the, the piece that we do in the Dory, like the Verona organization got like hundreds of kids, and I know Glenn Lee, um the VAR, you know, if anybody's gonna play baseball out there, seriously, the VAR is gonna need an upgrade. So, but I think in the meantime, like while y'all are all getting together, you will need like a really super commitment from Glenn Lee because you really are making a super investment. Yeah, but I'm, you know, I mean, if, it, if it's, I mean, like, I'm, 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 I'm supporting. Yeah, absolutely. Try. So I think also, Mr. Thornton or uh, Mr. Brandon, there may be a different access because right now the way you get into the park, is you drive down this industrial road. Um, there's a parking lot there that historically uh, at night is not good as far as act you know crime activity, but the neighborhood in the back there may be a possibility for connecting right here, 
perhaps. And we'll look at that and opening that park up and making it more of a. Uh, that's how that's how the baseball people get to that the bridge um so i, I must be talking about something different no, that, there's I'm, a bridge there after yeah there's a bridge yeah. but they play they used to play football back there too yeah so yeah here's i know the bridge, bridge is how you kind of got to the football part yeah 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 but Commissioner Nelson's point. So they done turn it to a, um, they done turn it, they done turn the um, old football field to baseball too. That's it? the football field there. The old, yeah, okay. that's the bigger okay. baseball, the majors, 12s, okay. so and the back okay. is a little, it's a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, hey, if you're going to put that much money into it, we're going to have to create another interest because the interest into that is, is like not. Yeah, I mean, right now, I can tell you from a calls for service standpoint, there are a lot of calls in that parking lot. So if you want to make this a, you know, more of a community amenity, you have an opportunity back here as well. I so think that's Neil, is Neil um, factoring that into the um, cost? Uh, we'll circle back with you, but again, what I'm telling if I'm sensing concurrence of the board, we'll come back to you with the new number. There may be some savings on the deep bottom side and we'll size all that up and schools X next week, then we'll circle back and have uh, something for the board. I mean, we, we all of our parks should be up to par, and and I I can see wanting to bring it up to par, but I, I just I, that's a a big number. I'm just curious. It's not just renovating a field, obviously, because I know what that costs. It's not, though, that's what I'm if you go back there, it's more. It's building a whole new complex. Yeah, but the but the rest of it that goes into. That goes into making it an accessible place is what is driving, which is pushing that cost up. I'm, I'm almost guaranteeing you that. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I don't, I don't. You're not going to be able to just make that a baseball place without fixing the access. So, yeah, you know what I'm saying. So you're going to have to fix the access to it. Like that got that has to be a part of the five million dollars. Must be. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. The infrastructure, there's yeah, a lot of structure part of it, yeah. a lot of infrastructure, yeah. it's not just the field right now. So, so let me, these all the plans that we have uh, for the parks, <clears throat> excuse me, are based on input. So, uh, he has, for instance, you know, in other words, the community is it and has been if they're not going to play baseball, is there something else they're going to do? I'm, I'm getting a note uh, from Neil that he's looking at baseball. Yeah. Sounds like football has moved, yeah, football. but let 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 us do let us as a staff go back and regroup. The project in the CIP has been at five million for a number of years. Let us check into that road access. I'm I'm getting the the, the feeling of the board, and we can add we can add it and come back with a new number. But if I'm sensing yes, go, we'll go and bring you back a new number. And you can do that by February 22nd. Absolutely. Yeah, we can get that done by Tuesday, 5 o'clock. <laughs> Mr. Don, you know that you move football when you move the rec center. You know, you move the football when you build the rec center. You know they move the football up to the rec center. Well, that's a discussion yeah. that, that I won't go into. Right, 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 right. But any park that can be improved in a community will increase the value of the houses. That's Absolutely. Oh, yeah, that. And that's. That part needs improvement. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't, yeah, and you yeah. pointed out. Yeah. Is it, does it have to be for the ball? Okay. So I'm sensing so uh, general. We have all of us on board, but we'd like to see what the scope is. You got it. So we will come back. With and the answer. scope. Yes, sir. Yep. And we'll just talk about that at the. Uh, Next work session, actually, not uh, this Tuesday, but the work session that we actually come back the second meeting. We'll do a work session with the information before we bring you the total. Okay. Thank you. All right. Should we ask? Yes, sir. Secretary George Campbell, about the statement. Uh, Mr. Hagen has uh, shared with us. You may recall, you and I have been here for some time, and we were together when we lost. But uh, what I want to say is, and what most of my colleagues now know, depends on how you do it. 
and keeping your message straight. And, and that's how come we lost at least one of those in the past. Your team, they, they replicated the same message. That's what people need to hear. Why is that a help? Why is that something that's beneficial for Hiranko County residents? And that's how come we got that. What I recall is losing the meals tax vote. And then when we had another one, I sat in here and got everybody together and I said, okay, pitch it. And everybody gave me a pitch and Joe Casey came with this really strong pitch about that people aren't necessarily going to pay for all of it. People from outside the county are going to pay for it. And I said, that's what's going to sell. Right. And that's all I talked about. So and this is where um, Jack Berry came in here and said, you know, put me on the team. <laughs> well, Paul, we had 130 meetings on public yes. in 2013. We were, right, we were out there a lot. Yeah. Uh, and, and all those meetings were pleasant. But, yeah. uh, and some of those were actually some of the best meetings we had because it was a uh, good about education um, and people understanding why it is we're asking. And what I'll say is that Mr. Gordon Park did pitch the park part of it, you know, portion of it better. But we need to know what's going on and how much and that sort of thing. I mean, it was all, but, it, yeah. yeah. But that's when I, I was looking at it. And I, as we have all said, that's why the drainage one is how are we going to pitch it? <laughs> that, that I haven't got a a real good feel for we have so. a good amount of time to, to strengthen yeah. that uh, and we'll make sure we have photos we have stories yeah. we'll make sure we have a strong push and we'll talk to terrell and his team I think, Please. I think uh mickey ogburn and i did five or six pta meetings yeah i think all, I mean, all of us were out there working so we even had some organizations, like if I can remember, um, didn't the realtors, yes, like we had some organizations get on and yeah. pay for some so it outside. Was, it was it was everybody. Yeah. I mean, it was all hands on deck. And what we didn't do was we didn't hamstring ourselves like we did before. I mean, we took a legal definition to the voters and it was it was the definition of insanity because after the second or third question that someone had, we would say either we can't answer that or, and the first question we answered was what? Tell me about the chicken at Publix. Is that going to have the meals tax on it? Do you remember that? Salad bar, chicken. Chicken at Publix. Well, that's the stuff that you guys, so Ms. O'Bannon is talking about the pitch. The pitch is going to be different from us than it is from you. Your pitch is not going to be my pitch. Correct. You got what I'm saying? Correct. So like whatever you guys say, that's going to be where staff is saying legally. I'm going to be pitching stuff in my district and stuff that's countywide that's going to help people that live in my district. And I, to me, that's an easy pitch. And Mr. Shepard's going to develop between six and eight videos as well. So yeah. easy things to go to a meeting, two, three minutes, not even, um, and easy ways to share information outside of even staff being there, just to show, share information and be on YouTube. And, yeah. If I'm in Saints, then I'm talking drink. If I'm in Highland Springs, I'm talking elementary school. I'm if, if I'm in rural Verona, I'm talking Deep Bottom Park. If I'm on Laburnum, I'm talking Fire Station Number Six. You see what I'm saying? Like it's like all these different places and different things that are that touch those areas. Miss Cincello, I offer the same to the school board, of course. Uh, and I recall uh, Mickey and I going out a number of times, even uh, and, and having some meetings back in 2016. So. As you, as you hear of uh, folks who want information, please let us know. We'll be out.